Do you know what it feels like to feel like you'll die before you ever truly got a chance to live? Or that you must make the most of today because tomorrow's uncertainty lies in your ability to take pills? Well, I do. Because for a long time, I struggled to find my place within this world. As a little girl, I always knew something about me was different. Late nights before bed, mama would call me in the kitchen to give me medicine and for years I questioned why this could possibly be. Why out of all my friends and cousins, none took medicine like me. And then the day finally came, my life would change, sitting in the kitchen. It was finally time to talk about the reason why all my life I had felt different. My eyes wide, ears sharp, curious to see. Too young to really understand the words, you were born with HIV. I didn't know it then, but those words would forever follow me. From that moment forward, something changed within my whole dichotomy. For years moving forward, I struggled with finding the true essence of me. Looking in the mirror, finding the heart to stomach my reality like, this can't be life will I ever find love or be someone's wife. I mean, this is a lot for me to carry. Do I really expect of all the girls to choose from? I'd be the one to marry. For years, these thoughts replayed in my brain, taking shots at my self-esteem like bullets to a frame. Doubt, worry, and fear had become my middle names and fighting with myself was becoming a losing game. My social circles echoed stigma, riddle, and ignorance. And for a moment in time, I suffered with indifference. Sleep to my ability to make impact. Intimidated by labels that degraded my very being, I wasn't what HIV was supposed to be. Beautiful, confident, and bold, I didn't fit the stereotype. Sick and bedridden, pain and grief stricken, I was different. I had an image to protect, or so I thought. But my need to be free superseded my need to fit in and be accepted by my peers. My truth became too heavy to carry or to hide. And that once felt indifference started to subside because clearly this disease was bigger than me. So I developed a sink or swim type of mentality to live or to die, to crumble or to thrive. Thrive with these gifts I've been bestowed from the top of my crown to the tip of my toes. I echo what it looks like to use my voice as a river of healing. Turn my pain into passion that's giving. Love that is uplifting. Power that is freeing. Joy that is gleaming and contagious. Overcoming obstacles seemingly outrageous. Courageous in my ability to walk in and stand in my truth. All while showing what this black girl magic do. Leave it to me to be the generational chain breaker, way maker, and creator like many other black women I see. I found purpose in my pain. Said my life is to leave a stain, it won't be in vain. Let it be in remembrance of strength, courage, and wisdom and what it looks like to come out on the other side of darkness and still shine bright. This warrior spirit born in me just like it was born in you. Beautiful black and brown women sitting throughout this room. We're connected through our stories and our ability to pave the way for others to be great. Our undeniable fortitude and the way we walk, the way we talk, and the way we take up space. When I envision love, abundance, understanding, and truth, I see my reflections in you. I see a world where we thrive within our communities, unlimited and uninhibited, met with love and little resistance. Where we are met with joy and peace, mental health support services, and permission to be free. A world where we have accessible health care, whether we can afford insurance or our own welfare. A world where integrative support services are at the foundation of healthcare because without a holistic approach, HIV is a death stare. It is deeper than just being prescribed pills. It goes in vain if all my other barriers to receiving care fall on deaf ears. It is not just about the body. The body don't function without proper care of the mind or the soul. So I envision a world where we are treated from a holistic approach. A world where comprehensive sex education isn't taught when it's too late, it's up to date and medically accurate in all 50 U.S. states. A world where my first time learning about HIV isn't when I test positive or from pregnancy. A world where mother to child transmission is a rarity. I envision a world where our voices matter and we have representation and decision making surrounding policy matters. And not only that, but that we also get paid for our time because our expertise and experiences are invaluable. So getting paid is the bare minimum line. 
I envision a world where we don't just survive getting hand claps and backpacks for being strong and resilient because most of us have faced insurmountable adversity met with resistance that just so happen to birth strength and resilience. I envision a world where we thrive, where we have some more supportive communities and networks that enhance our lives. A world where we're no longer fighting to have a place at the table. We naturally create space and set the standard for greatness. A world where our spirits speak for us when we walk in rooms and our magnetic boldness is impossible to remove. I envision a world where we unapologetically walk in and stand in our truths. I envision this for you. I envision this for me. To show the world what it looks like to unapologetically thrive with HIV. Well, thank you. Strength, courage, and wisdom. Welcome. I am Dr. Maisha Sandifer, Director of Population Health here at Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. Again, thank you for joining us. And we're welcoming you on today's policy webinar focusing on the voice of Black women across the HIV spectrum. We are here to amplify that voice. We thank you again for joining us. We'd like to highlight some of the efforts that are going on and we will again talk about some of the future efforts that are going on across the city, across the state and across the nation as we continue to amplify this voice just as USCHA did when we highlighted the theme of that particular conference this past September on a love letter to black women. We are here, we are ready to be amplified and optimize all of those voices today. And I will now turn over the remaining part to the moderator, Ms. Leisha McKinley. Beach, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, and welcome, welcome. Um, I see so much uh, dialogue already happening in the chat. Um, and yes, Dr. Stanfire, the theme love letter to black women. Yes. We are going to set the stage for this amazing conversation. Uh, be before I bring up the three dynamic Black women um, who I'm loving on today, we have an amazing woman who is going to level set for us by sharing her story, her journey with HIV. And for today's purposes, we are referring to my beautiful sister as Anonymous. So you can refer to me as Simone, as I've chosen to speak with you all anonymously today. I'm a mother, daughter, sister, auntie, Spelman graduate, educator, and I'd like to say chef as well, but I don't know if my family would co-sign that title. I am also an African-American woman in my 30s living with HIV in Metro Atlanta. I was diagnosed with HIV seven months ago. Since that day, I have felt every emotion you can think of. Disbelief, fear, anger, shame, determination, resentment, hopelessness, hopeful, you name it, I guarantee I felt it. I have decided to share a small piece of my story today because what I felt most is invisible. However, being invisible is not a feeling that's foreign to me as I'm a black woman in America. I just wasn't prepared for how immense the weight of not feeling seen would be as I navigate my HIV diagnosis and the stigma that comes along with it. There is no part of my new life that being HIV positive hasn't impacted from my overall health, housing, employment, parenting, family, dating, and friendships. But I was expected to just carry on as if everything was normal, as if nothing had changed. But everything has changed, and it was all in an instant. Things changed internally for me and yet the world carried on. 
how I've been seeing myself, being hypersensitive to how people engage with me, interacting with me, with families and friends. Then there is the real world check-in. And I realized that I didn't want to be treated differently, but I needed to be treated differently because of this heavy weight that I was now carrying. There's a constant internal battle, fighting to be seen and heard, but not wanting to be seen solely as my diagnosis because I am so much more. When I met with my doctor for the first time, she asked me if I had any questions or concerns as she began pulling up my file. I said the first thing that I had written on my iNote on my phone, I don't want to die. You see, despite a bachelor's degree, master's degree, combos with my gynecologist, years of advocacy for diversity, equity, and inclusion, my medical professional friends and family, Spelman sisters, girlfriends, aunties, grandmas, a mother, acquaintances, despite all of these influences in my life, no one ever talked to me about HIV. I knew it existed, but somehow never considered it a threat. Well, at least not a threat to me. So my ignorance persisted and allowed me to make that statement to my doctor with a straight face, because all I did know about HIV was it leads to AIDS, and AIDS leads to death, and I didn't want to die. I now know better, thanks to my doctor, nurses, therapists, and advocates who have all been Black women, by the way. I've had the honor of meeting so many phenomenal Black women who are carving out safe spaces where we can be seen and heard along this journey, and I'm so thankful. But I'm also left wondering, how did I miss the elephant in the room? How did my gynecologist never mention certain STIs make you more susceptible and encourage me to take PrEP? Why am I seeing PrEP commercials, but they aren't centering women that look like me if I'm a part of the demographic that's being hit hardest? How did I attend a campus built for Black women and never become aware of how HIV was wreaking havoc on Black women in the South? Why are Black and brown people hit hardest by this pandemic, but not in leadership positions to lead the fight against it? I have many more questions than answers right now, if I'm being honest, and I'm angry because once again, I'm reminded of my invisibility. I'm reminded how there are gatekeepers at every turn of this journey that decide if they are going to provide refuge or compound my trauma. Because whether they realize it, they are influencing my decision to adhere or withdraw. In my first doctor appointment after I was assured I would live, she explained, as long as I took my meds and stayed up with my appointments. That seems simple enough. Who would not want to take medicine that was going to save their life. Again, my ignorance was on full display because what she didn't tell me is that every morning I woke up to take it was going to feel like a paper cut, another painful reminder of this mistake I made and the weight I had to carry for the rest of my life, or that even after I face that daily triggering and start to get the hang of things, that once that three-month appointment comes up, it doesn't matter how stable I feel, Something as simple as not being able to find the new building or a place to park or the office being on a busy street visible to traffic can act as a deterrent to me coming back. I've realized my invisibility has made me hyper aware of how people interact with me. So a look, a tone, an attitude from the receptionist, pharmacist, nurse, or doctor has so much more influence on whether I'm going to leave feeling empowered for the next three months or leave being reminded of my invisibility and questioning if I want to continue to subject myself to this. I ask that we continue to hold spaces like this for Black women where our voices are elevated and we are given the power and agency to dictate the changes that are needed to enact the type of systemic changes that are needed to address this pandemic. So there won't continue to be more Simones coming forward saying, you still do not see me. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to my experience. Thank you so much, Simone, for such a powerful um, revelation, a sharing of what your journey has been like. And I can tell you that for the next 60 minutes, you have an entire village of Black women leaders and experts that um, will share their experiences, will share their journey, and will share knowledge 
so that not only do you recognize that you are not alone, but that you also are seen by this entire beautiful community. So to our audience, please help me welcome Miss Tori Cooper, Miss Tammy Kenny, and Miss Beautiful Divine. Ladies, I have so been looking forward uh, to this conversation since I heard it was going down. Um, and I'm so honored to uh, have this time and spend this moment with you. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, but not in not in the traditional way, right? Because if it was traditional, it wouldn't be me anyway. <laughs> um, I I want you I want you to think about that thing that makes you smile when you think about being a black woman from Georgia, that thing that make, yeah, what Tori already doing, that thing make you lean back in your chair, be like, oh, girl, yes, that thing. And, and, and to our audience, <laughs> um, I'm not going to leave you out. We're going to give you a chance to put in the chat as well. You might not be from Georgia. You might be from the South. Uh, but what's what's that thing? I'm gonna start with you, Sister Cooper. What's what's that thing that just make you smile when you think about being a black woman from Georgia? Come on, Miss Peach. Hey, everybody! And first of all, really, just um, I, I have tissues around because of Kayla and and uh, Simone Anonymous. That actually makes me proud to be a Georgia Peach because Black women are doing the damn thing. And it's wonderful to hear and experience Black women feeling power and experiencing power, because you can feel power without experiencing it. Feeling and experiencing power. And also, even after a diagnosis like HIV for both of them, having an opportunity to find some peace in that, and then strength in that, and then motivation, not just for themselves, but for others. So I am inspired uh, living in Atlanta or Metro Atlanta, um, and I'm inspired by other Black women who are beautiful and brilliant and bold and unabashedly so. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Tori. Um, and I see the Lizzo of public health. We may be asking you for an A and B flute selection. <laughs> yes, at the, uh, at the end. Yes, yes. Miss Kenny, what what what's that thing that makes you smile when you think about being a black woman from the great state of Georgia? Well, first of all, my signature line that everybody knows: "Hello, America." This is Miss Tammy coming to you live. <laughs> it is such an honor to be here with Tori and Beautiful and McKinley Beach. This makes me proud to be a Black woman first and foremost. But when I became unapologetic about who I am, my voice became very loud. Now, everybody can get a good night's sleep. We can all sleep at night now knowing that me, I'm good with who I am as a Black woman living in rural Georgia. Okay. All right, uh, Sister Kenny, uh, for those of you who might not have known who Tammy was referring to when she said McKinley Beach, I know because y'all are young audience. See, <laughs> all the Black women, when, when there's a bond, a kindred, a sisterhood, is known by us referring to each other by our last name. And so Tammy always refers to me as McKinley Beach. See, that's why I know that she's my <laughs> sister. She can also put me in check. <laughs> well, to our, our last finalist, the one whose name truly represents how she is showing up today, beautiful, 
share with our audience what's that thing girl that just makes you smile uh, to be a black woman in the state of georgia Greetings, everyone. Hello. I am beautiful with two L's, living and loving and learning how to love myself all over again. So the thing that makes me smile, you, the community, just being able to be around individuals that could give me that love and support that I may not have felt in other places that I've grown up in, to be able to be support and be a listening ear for my other sister that may not have no one to speak to or talk to, just the camaraderie within community and family. That's what makes me smile, just to let someone know that it's not over and we can start again tomorrow and be the best you can be. Well, to our panelists, I don't know if you have uh, seen in the chat, uh, there are folks who are saying uh, what makes them smile is being a Black Georgia peach. Uh, <laughs> Being ATL strong. Oh, I know they from Metro. Uh, that's a that's a Metro <laughs> saying. Um, but to our audience, do you see uh the amazing women um that we are about to embark on this conversation with? I also want to thank Tori for reminding me that what set the stage for, I don't know if you feel it, but I'm feeling this very beautiful moment right now. Uh, we got to thank Kayla uh, for her amazing gift in artistry of poetry and the way that she expresses and remind us about this is what HIV looks like. It looks beautiful. It looks empowered. You know, it, it looks brilliant. It looks intelligent. It looks strong. It looks like somebody who is thriving. And to Simone, I hope that you are still with us and you're getting a chance to see all of your these sisters that you got access to as you are embarking on this journey. So ladies, I'm not going to call anyone um, out again, you ha however the spirit leads you to respond um, mm -hmm. to the next series of questions, please feel free to do so. Now, I wanted to start out with something positive that just kind of reminds us about uh, that thing that still gives us joy about being from the South or being from Georgia, but I also don't want to be naive. I want us to kind to kind of set the stage here and let's dive into health care. Not necessarily HIV, um, but I want to just, I want to hear from you what you have seen, observed, or experienced as it relates to accessing health care for women in all of our diversity in the south what what what's that narrative any any of you what's the narrative i i think for me living in the rural south in rural georgia what I see is not so much of what we have, is what we don't have for Black women. We need more integrated health services. We need more prevented, preventive services for Black women. We need more access to, we got about two or three clinics and basically they don't address the whole needs of women period. But since we're having this conversation about black women, because we have unique experiences and we also have, it's a uniqueness about us that we may need different care, right? So in my mind and in my thoughts, we have lack of resources, lack of access. And then when people have to drive 60 to 70, over 100 miles to get health care. Something is wrong with that. And I live in the rural area. 
and I drive 65 miles for my health care. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about the women who don't have transportation, who don't know how to navigate the resources. We need to take a bigger look at what's going on in our rural areas when it comes to Black women accessing the care that they need. Thank you, Tammy. So I'm a Taurus Gemini cusp, and the Taurus of me wants to, always wants to move ahead and break down <laughs> brick walls and build something new in its place. But the Gemini side of me makes me want to see things from more than one perspective. So I'll give, I'll let the Gemini win on this particular one. And when I think about a Black women accessing care or not accessing care in the South, I think about how as Black women, we have to fight so often for things that we shouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, um, mammograms. Mm -hmm. I happen to not have a uterus. However, I know that Georgia is also one of those states that's pr ranked pretty highly for mm -hmm. maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. And also for children, and babies dying soon after birth and, and so many other things that are preventable. And so having access to not just care, but preventative care, for prenatal care, for mm -hmm. postnatal care, all of those things, no woman, no person who's giving birth should have to, or is considering giving birth, should ever have mm -hmm. to fight for those things. And then it's being a, a Black woman who happens to also be transgender, um, the fact that the U.S. government recognizes me as a woman, the people in my life recognize me as a woman, and the healthcare wants to fight me because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. So I have, I'm also 53 years old, and because I'm 53 and was born with a prostate, that means I have to have both gynecological care, but mm -hmm. also care for my prostate mm -hmm. and a mammogram. And because I pay insurance every month, I shouldn't have to. And people who are like me should not have to fight. Those are fights that we shouldn't have to take uh, take on. But yet as Black women, we're used to fighting for the things that we need and also people in our community and our families need. So I'm inspired by the fact that we continue to fight and break down barriers. There was actually some legislation um, just today about trans-affirming care in Georgia mm -hmm. um, that uh, there was a, 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 a law being proposed that would uh, block access to uh, block insurers from being able to provide trans affirming health care and thankfully mm -hmm. earlier this morning mm -hmm. um that that bill was passed uh, was um struck down so i'm optimistic about that but we shouldn't have to fight those fights i'm optimistic because we do and we mm -hmm. win and when we win when black women are healthier that means every Everybody in our circle is healthy. That means everybody in our family is healthier. And in turn, everyone in our community can be healthier. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Beautiful. What, what, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> My thoughts are, so a little background. I'm a community health worker and I just um, finished up a health initiative, um, Black Women's First Initiative through HRSA. And basically what that initiative do is alleviate barriers to health care, whether it be mental health or medical. So all too often I see every single day, even though the initiative is over, I still work with my Black and Brown trans women and cis women of color. And it could be just the basic things like if they're thinking in their mind that stigma is holding them back from their health care, then they can't they can't even phantom about going to the doctor. If you are a black woman of trans experience and if you go to a facility and they misgender you, they don't respect how you show up and they call you by your birth name if you haven't changed your name yet. So it's a lot of factors, especially in the South, when there aren't as many resources or accessibility to be able to change your name or change your gender marker. So you can go to these healthcare facilities and they can respect you as the human that you are. And I mean, just right now I'm dealing with a situation that an individual of black trans experience, um, 
they did something crazy and because not really crazy. So normal life, black trans woman, you meet a guy, you chill with them. Their parents find out that the person that you dealt with was a trans experience. They're young, but they're legal. And then because the individual didn't know her rights as an individual, she got a pedophile charge. So when she become a sex offender, it's hard for me to house her anywhere that's close to any schools, any children. And so if I can't keep her in housing, then she's homeless. So she's couch surfing, she's living in the park. And if you're living in a park and you're positive, it's like, okay, what, what do I do? I want to get a job, but I don't have an address. I need to get another ID because I lost that because somebody robbed me while I was living in the park the other night while I was sleeping in the park. So it's like, what, what do I do? So we tackle one day at a time. Hey, sorry this happened to you. I'll get you some fresh clothes. We'll get you some cards so you can travel on MARTA. Maybe you can get a little part-time or a little gig at the temp agency. So at least you would get a room for the night. And so just starting there with the basics is keep them from all health disparities. So it's just like if there were more resources or there weren't so many barriers to the resources, then I think it would help a lot of um, disparities in the South. So I'm going to recap what I heard our distinguished panelists say. Um, uh, but before I do that, I want our panelists to see the hashtags that their comments have generated. Hashtag that is health equity. Hashtag health and wellness. Hashtag black women first. Um, and those hashtags have come about because you all spoke about access uh, for uh, health care in general in rural communities. Tammy's talking about driving more than 50 miles. Uh, when she said it, it made me think about the 90s, but she not talking about the 90s. I'm assuming, Tammy, that you have gotten health care since the 90s. You, you talking yeah. about 2023. Yes. That to be able to access health care services to have to drive 60 miles um, to Metro to be able to do that. Tori is talking about access to health care services showing up as a human being, right? And being entitled and not having to fight for all of the services that she needs as a woman of trans uh, experience. And beautiful is sharing with us sometimes how one moment can change your life forever. And the way that our healthcare infrastructure is set up, that that moment is, in, is impacting being able to give um, the services and the care that someone needs um, to be able to thrive living with HIV. And so to our audience, I want to hear not more of the comments about healthcare access. I just want you to start forming and framing what might be some of our solutions, even right here in the Peach State as community advocates and folks, what can we do? Now, to our panelists, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see the CDC uh, surveillance data that came out this week. And at this point of my work in HIV, I thought there was nothing left to surprise me. I don't know why this caught me off guard, but it did. And I want to I want to ask your thoughts around this. So as a part of the surveillance data, CDC looked at the region of residence for the new HIV diagnoses. These, this is 2022. So the data from last year, there was 37 um, plus thousand new HIV 
diagnoses last year, 20,000 of them was from the South. 37,000 new HIV cases, as my grandmother would say in these United States, but 20,000 of them were from the South. What's, what's the first thought that comes to mind when you hear that? First thing that comes to my mind is, well, we kind of knew it. I can't speak for the folks who are in the chat, but the four of us kind of figured that how it was going to work out because that is traditionally how it works out. Um, there are uh, so, so many more diagnoses in the South, in part because many of the, of the places that we live, and even if we're not, if we're AT aliens and just landed here from some other place, many of us came from the South um, even before we made it to Atlanta. But those of us, those folks who come from the North, you know that there are many, far more places across the North where access to PrEP and PrEP services, which can be different than PrEP, or at least education around sexual health and HIV is a more readily available than it is in the South. We know that living in the Bible Belt, we're kind of in the buckle of the Bible Belt you know, the part that ties it all in together because we're bigger and, and have more political weight than a lot of other places across the South. But we also know that um, there is this fear by, it, well, it's hypocritical fear because it's not really fear, but folks who don't like to talk about sex and healthy sex and happy sex. And if we can't talk about sex in a way that's both healthy and happy, then we have to deal with the repercussions. And unfortunately for Black women across the South, one of the biggest repercussions is an HIV diagnosis. Also, we're seeing an increase in uh, syphilis and in syphilis uh, in newborns um, in, 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 at a rate that hasn't been seen in decades, that is at historic rates. And so all of those things really tie in together. So there's the lack of even basic education around sex, sexual health, and pleasurable sex because of how some people feel about their own sex mm -hmm. and how they want to control, and I put this in the chat, how a goal is to control the existence, the every part of existence for people who are not white, cisgender, heterosexual males uh, who make over a certain amount of money. Everybody else is being... Um, legislated into functioning in society the way that, that they do. And unfortunately, that's not really working very well. Um, what you just gave was a great example of why this happening because a, a, a high percentage of those new diagnoses were among Black women. And then I also, thank you, Tori, thank you. But I also want to add, looking at the different vulnerabilities that affect black women. And I know here in the rural South, we have homelessness. When your back up, when your back is up against a wall and you need a place to sleep, you need a good shower and there's no agency that can put you up for the night. What are you going to do when you have that opportunity and somebody come along and say, hey, you can stay over here two or three days and take a shower and get you a meal. Even if your mind tells you, I don't want to have sex, but I need to sleep. Why? I've been out on the streets. I got an opioid addiction or either whatever the addiction may be. I can hear some sisters in the rural South saying, Lord, I need a good night's sleep. And then you don't know how to have that conversation about you got to use a condom because whoever that person may be, man or woman or whatever, they may not want to use a condom. And it's almost like, here I go again. We got to be able to address these vulnerabilities that are happening to black women, black folks in general. 
And Tammy, thank you so much for sharing that. And beautiful, I'm coming to you. But I, I just want to I want to piggyback for a moment on what you just said, because the reality is I can go to all of your um, HIV one on one classes. You can teach me all about the tools that I have access to. But if I'm hungry enough or if I'm tired enough, none of that stuff is relevant. Right. My immediate need. And so we done packaged it in a nice term and called it social determinants of health. But the truth of the matter is until we are able to address some of the systemic issues around poverty, um, around workforce development, that we're going to keep seeing those type of numbers show up in the regions with the least amount of resources in the regions where healthcare clearly is not the priority as we see so many of the states remaining in the country who did not expand Medicaid happen to be in the region, right? Where we see the most HIV cases. Beautiful, talk to me. What, what, what are your thoughts about this data? So my thoughts are, just to piggyback on both the two extraordinary ladies before me and yourself, um, when, when you stop talking about sex early on, let's say high school, when you don't have that sex education in schools, and so people are experimenting, they're doing whatever they want to do, people act like teenagers are not going to have sex, they are going to have sex, they're having sex, and they're doing whatever comes, listen, I, well, I didn't know about protection because I know this feel good. So I'm going to keep going. And then when you don't have nowhere to stay, like Miss Tammy said, you, you're just surviving. And when you survive, you be put in situations that you just have to get through that next five hours. It could be one o'clock in the morning and somebody said, hey, listen, and you think let's in your mind like, oh, you know what? I've been out in this park. It's been 40 degrees for four days. And this person just said, only thing I have to do is just have a little session. Okay, I'm gonna have that little session. And then you know that that person, oh, no, I want to feel everything. And so you don't you don't have that awkward three seconds to say, hey, I got a condom, you you have to put this on, or I have to put this on. You know what I'm saying? You just want to get through that time. Like Miss Tammy said, you want to lay down for at least six hours and not worry about getting robbed. And then again, in that situation, you might get robbed. So it's all about survival, education. And I think that if we move forward in more of a holistic approach, because holistically, it's talking about the whole person, not just HIV. It's about where I have somewhere to stay tonight. Because if I don't have anywhere to stay tonight, then I'm not worried about going to get my meds or going to a facility to even get treatment because I'm just trying to figure out where I'm, where I'm going to sleep at. I don't want to be in a shelter because the shelter gave me too many rules. I'm grown. How are you going to tell me I need to be in by six? Then you're going to tell me I need to be out by seven. And where I'm going to go? What I'm going to do? I don't have a job because I don't have an ID. So it's like, it's so many different determinants that have people surviving out here. And that's exactly what it is. People are just surviving on both ends, whether they're of trans experience or they're just um, cis women. They're, everyone is just surviving. And then we're not even going to get into if an individual is going to intimate partner violence. So it's like, okay, so either I get my, you know, what beat every day and deal with this, or I can say, listen, I'm uproot me and my family, and we're going to get away from this situation. So it's so many different things that could cause people not to even care anymore. So they just do what they have to do just to survive. Y'all, there is a I man. I can't keep up with the chat. It's just when you when y'all start talking, the chat just starts uh uh blowing up. Um, and just a few comments. I see one is highlighted already. It's talking about survival sex, which is uh what you all have been uh describing. There's a uh Tori, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you because I think you sparked something around this discussion with condoms. Um, and I, I see Cynthia says that's why female condoms need to come out in full circulation just as much as male condoms and prep. Um, I want to get your, your thoughts, uh, on that, but we've been talking about access, right? 
And so I want to I want to throw this in there, uh, Tori, before you respond. In our HIV STI world, uh, and I I see our former uh, syphilis girl Michelle Allen is with us. Um, hashtag I'm not outing her. If you don't know Michelle, if you do know Michelle, you know why I refer to her as syphilis girl. But in that HIV STI world. We like to believe that we have reached everybody. And so everybody is showing up to the HIV, not the, not HIV 101, to the HIV 101 classes. They done got the condoms. They done got the, the dental dams. I don't even know if we still give that stuff out. But the reality is there are many folks that we've never touched, we've never reached, um, and they don't have access to that. And some who do may choose that condoms are not an option for them. And Tori, since you opened the door, I want I want you to walk on through it, right? And just kind of talk about in this era of HIV prevention and STI treatment, what role do condoms play? Um, and in how are people responding to them? Okay. So my opinions are exclusively mine and are not representative of, uh, who sponsored us today? The sponsors or the place who pays my salary every two weeks. With that being said, as a black woman, I enjoy having sex without condoms, period, period. I use condoms with new partners. I use condoms sometimes with the same partners who may have other partners. If you are a person who's living with HIV, for many of us, we don't think of, or if you happen to be a person who's not of childbearing age, then immediately there are two of the biggest things that we think about condoms used for that are out of the way. If you're a person who's living with HIV and have an undetectable viral load, in your mind, you're thinking, well, I can't give away HIV or I can't get HIV, so I don't need a condom. I've had conversations with my partner. We are on one accord about that. If you're a person who's not a childbearing age any longer, or for whatever reason can't have children, or perhaps don't have the equipment to have children like I can, then that takes another barrier out. That takes another um reason for condom use out of the way. And so you can't see syphilis. There are people being stigmatized for having uh, vaginitis and um, uh, genital warts on our timelines. And so there's a certain amount of stigma that comes from HIV that doesn't come from STIs. And then add to that the basic STI knowledge that many of us don't have because, again, our children, even us, we're not at, at, at church talking about herpes. But we know that a significant number of Black women and the people that we have sex with have a herpes diagnosis, even if they don't know it. It's just the numbers game. And so because we're not having conversations about what actually, wh where STIs actually exist and how folks get them and how folks share them, then what we're doing is putting at risk. I hope that people make the best healthcare decisions for themselves at all times. But what you just heard from my sisters here, from Beautiful and Tammy, sometimes the best healthcare decision means I need to have a place to lay until the sun comes up. That's right. Oh, this is both both of us are a little inebriated, so neither of us can go to the next room or to my purse or to that, that dresser over there and get this condom. Mm -hmm. That's the real talk. That's real life situation. And so until we're able to understand as Black women and as people who love Black women, because everybody on here might not be a Black woman, until we acknowledge that those are real life circumstances and the opposition wants us to just fall into the, the, the pit of, of, of all of those different pits, then we have to make the best and most healthiest decisions for ourselves at all times. Sometimes that doesn't include a condom. 
Oftentimes it does. Yes, know your partner, but also be mindful of the fact that you have to protect yourself even before you protect your partner. Well said, uh, Tori, well said. Uh, and uh, thank you for the disclaimer. However, however, it is important that when we get these opportunities to have these type of conversations, we're not coming prepared with the script, right? What is the truth? I know what it looked like in the lab, but when we get it out here on the street and in the community, those structured models and interventions don't always translate the way that researchers say that they would if we implement them, you know, to fidelity. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, I want to acknowledge, I put a link in the chat. Somebody sent me this text at 2 a.m. I love y'all and y'all know infectious disease and HIV is what I do. <laughs> But you can hold it at least to seven. Y'all hold it to seven. Because I done got up two o'clock this morning when I saw the chat come through. This is about a man being arrested for STD exposure. It's not so much about the story that I want you to go and see. I want you to read the comments from the people who read the story. Right? And we talk about stigma. And, and I'm, we're going to bring it home. We're going to talk about solutions. But I, we, we can't get to the solutions mm -hmm. without bringing this piece in right here. Stigma looks like for us might be different than the way stigma looks for other folk or other community or other genders. Can, mm -hmm. can we at least acknowledge that? Right? And so we talk about it. I hear it. But I don't often hear people do that deeper dive, beautiful, into then what is the stigma, right? As it associates with, with Black women and HIV. What does that stigma look like? I'm going to add one more. Not just Black women and all of our diversity and HIV, but Black women and all of our diversity and HIV mm -hmm. in the South. What what does that look like? What is that thing that has us to the point to where I'm afraid around disclosure? What is that thing or those <clears throat> things that has me to the point of why I'm afraid to access health care services? You share yours and I'm going to share mine before we ask our final question. So... Stigma. I always reference stigma to being that big bully from high school that you see in the hallway and you turn around and you run away from that big bully because you don't want your lunch money or your lunch to be taken. Stigma is that big old bully from school that nobody wants to play with. Then getting back into Black women, the community, the church, what happens in this house stays in this house. Don't talk about it. If if you're not talking about going to school and going to church on Sunday, I don't want to hear nothing that you have to say about whatever experience that you went through this week with that young man or young woman. So therefore, people don't talk about it in your home. If you don't talk about it in your home, you're not going to talk about it in school. And that's the problem, education. And you're not going to disclose because you're like, if my mom told me not to say something about something minute or small, then I'm definitely not going to talk about oh, I had unprotected sex with this person that I really didn't know, but it was feeling good, so I didn't stop. You know what I'm saying? And that's how STDs, STIs happen. That's how HIV happened because we're not talking about it. And in the Black community, if you're not working a nine to five, making $100,000, two cars in a garage, a big house, and going to church every Sunday, they don't want to hear about it. You're not living that right life. So it comes with a lot of things that came from the beginning of time that, listen, we're not going to talk about it. If it's not pleasing in God's sight and your auntie, then we're not going to talk about it. And that's where most of rejection and isolation. So you don't want to be isolated, even though you know you need to tell somebody, you know you need to talk about it, but it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm about to be ousted from the family. And what happens is 
you deal with that person, you get in a toxic relationship, then you start getting beat up or whatever the case may be. And things just spiral and it's snowball. And it's like, I've lost everything. I'm sick because I didn't want to talk about it. I know that something is wrong with my body, but I can't go to that facility to get checked out or to get a test to see what's going on with my body because the doctor I have, maybe she know my auntie, my auntie going to tell my mama, they're going to find out at the church, then I can't teach Sunday school, then they're going to find out my job. You know, it's so many different levels to stigma. And it's a big bully from high school. And I'm going to knock that bully down every time. And anyone that comes in my presence, we're going to be great. Because we're going to beat that bully up. I can't say what I really want to say, but we're going to beat him up. You just say it. it. (laughs) No, don't tell me that. My sister, no, I got a mouth. (laughs) So here's a little short story. I know we're running out of time. But where the stigma plays in from listening to what Tori said and beautiful. I was that girl that needed a good night's sleep, a bath, and something to eat in the shower. So it was an organization in Atlanta, not calling a name, that was giving out blankets and book bags. So I found somebody that was going to let me go in and get a good night's sleep, something to eat, take a shower, all of that. When I walked in, I basically said, I got a few dollars. I give it to you. I don't want to have sex. When I laid my bag down, He had the same bag in his chair, and he also had the blanket. Now, this is where my stigma and his stigma came in, because why we couldn't talk about it? I know he's seen my bag. It's on the chair. Mm -hmm. He tells me, you look good. Ain't nothing wrong with you. I know ain't nothing wrong with you. But I'm saying we got the same bag, and the only way you could get this bag is that particular organization only serve people with living with HIV? Right there was a prime example of stigma because we both could not come together and say, you know what, I'm HIV positive. Mm-hmm. We couldn't even talk about that. Mm-hmm. And that stigma right there, when you can't talk about it, will lead you to go to the next level. Mm-hmm of unprotected sex. So stigma falls in so many different categories and areas of people's lives. So thank you, Tori, for sharing that. I had to get this in, beautiful. That's another part of stigma, McKinley Beach. When you can't talk about it with another person that's living with HIV. Sister Cooper, any comments, thoughts, or questions? Yes. So, um, this I know this is an elevated group, and you all did a great job of curating the guest list and all this stuff, but I feel like it has to be said every time we have an opportunity to say it. I know that there are some women who detest being referred to as cisgender. Mm-hmm. I know it. We hear about it. I've heard folks fighting over it. I couldn't give a rat's ass. So it is the word. It's so cisgender and transgender are words that were created. I always, this is probably not what happened, but I always say some white man in lab coats created these words to describe us, and we didn't have anything to do with these words. Well, sis, if I got to be trans, you got to be cis. Understanding that cis and trans simply describe the journey to womanhood or to personhood. Cis comes from the Latin root, which means same as. Trans means changed or on the other side of. All right. So when you're being referred to as a cisgender woman, do not be offended. That just means a woman who's the same as she was assigned at birth. If I have to hear one more time of being identified as a trans woman, as if that's something different, it might be special and it is different, but it's not different in a bad way. It just describes my journey to womanhood. All right. So if we can get over that barrier, then maybe we can all fight together better because the same things that are out to get you are out to get me and vice versa. And one more thing before I cut this microphone off, we're having sex with the same people. 
So if you're so stuck up on being called cisgender that you're forgetting all the other stuff that goes along with it, then you're in trouble more so than I am, all right? Mm -hmm. So let, let's get past that so we don't have to have a whole nother conversation around. So, uh, Tori, what you just described is a, at least another webinar series in 2024. Um, and, it's, and it's a series. Uh, we Even virtually, we might have to get uh, Atlanta's finest on, on the Zoom or the stream yard um, for the conversation. But it has to be had. Because that the whole reason for posing that question was around, let's be clear, stigma among Black women in all of our diversity is very different than the stigma we talking about for white gay men, the stigma that we are talking about, you know, among other people. And so until we own what those issues are and address it, we're not going to move the needle uh, further towards ending new HIV diagnoses, not just in this country, not just in the South, but in the state of Georgia. And so my final question or my, my final question to this group that I would also like those in the, um, uh, the our participants to, to post in the chat too. I'm gonna give you a moment to think about it. Now we've been on this journey about ending the HIV epidemic. There's some nice little slides with pillars and we do step one through five. This gonna be over in seven years. It's cute, that stuff is cute. But the reality is it's not going down like that for us. It's not. And so what I want to hear from you, this is this is us level setting for next year, 2024. We get in the plan together now. What is that one thing, panelist and audience, for you that we got to elevate or we got to implement? to be able to get us closer to ending this epidemic. It's a lot of stuff. Y'all don't 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 write the dissertations in the chat. I'm asking for the one. That one thing to you. Don't, it don't have to be for nobody else. It's personal to you that we got to elevate, implement or start to get us closer to ending the epidemic and now I'm going to make it very personal for black women, what's the one thing? For me, in my mind, I sit at home at night and I create a toolbox and I put all the necessary, I go back to back in the day when the only thing that we could talk about, right, is condoms and or not having sex. And I'll be looking at folks like, no, people are gonna have sex now. Me too. Okay, but I try to learn from other sisters what this is going to look like. So when you create a toolbox and you got to add COVID in with that as well, we can't separate the two. So we got to talk about, we got to continue to talk about condoms. We got to continue to talk about know your status, get tested. We got to continue the education and awareness, but we got to talk about these new tools that we have in the toolbox. We got to talk about prep. We got to be able to dismantle and address the vulnerabilities that people have. Housing, no support for senior mothers that are living and not living with HIV. We got to address these political social determinants of health. We got to do some more work. And I'm going to leave it at that. We got to understand we got tools. We just need to use them. Um, I would like to say that my fantasy is a holistic approach. 
if you think about the whole person and not just HIV, not just STIs, not just mental health, because you need all these ingredients to put in a bowl to make this amazing cake, right? So if we talk about education, if we talk about open communication, because without education, we don't know what to talk about. We don't know the questions to ask. Therefore, Miss Tammy, when we in that dark room with the same individual with the same bag, see, we don't talk about those things that we can't address those things because then that's confirmation that I have something that I don't want to be dealing with, even though we both got it, but we're not going to talk about it because if I say that, then, oh, it's a reality check. Oh, I am diagnosed with HIV. Wow. And it could be simple. Look, I got this. You got that. Okay. So let's make sure we don't have no STIs. Then maybe that fourth round, we don't have to use the condom. But you know, we can't start at the first round because it's like, look, we just going to do it. We ain't going to talk about it. I don't have it. So one thing, the holistic approach, period. Then we can talk about education. Then we have that open conversation. And then maybe having that open conversation would alleviate some of that stigma that we see in the black community because all that stigma is, is people not knowing. So if we don't know about something, I had to close my eyes. If we don't know about something, we're just going to keep going until we figure it out. And that's why we have larger cases of SCI and HIV. Say yes to yourself, saying yes to life. That's all. I love that saying yes to yourself. And I will, so I will approach it from a different aspect. I agree with everything my sisters just said. Um, and I will also add this. Um, I don't think, that we, so I think the most effective way to end, and I'm using air quotes here, to end the HIV epidemic is to ensure as much as we can that every Black woman who's living with HIV gets everything that she needs, that's the holistic approach, to get to and maintain an undetectable viral load. Scientifically speaking, everybody can't do that, and we understand that. But still, if she gets everything she needs, that means she has out. I mean, she has healthcare. That means if, if English is not her first language, she has actually access to translation services, um, OBGYN care, et cetera, et cetera. So ensuring that Black women who have HIV have everything that they need to get to an undetectable viral load means that for every person who gets to an undetectable viral load and maintains it, you can't pass HIV along. All right. And if you can no longer pass HIV along, then that means there are no new exposures. And that becomes an effectively an end to the HIV epidemic, or it moves HIV into a different phase. It becomes more manageable. It becomes something um, where we can take some of the money away from other strategies that may not be working so well and use them to support housing programs and educational programs and medical services and ex transportation services, et cetera, et cetera. So ensuring that every Black woman who has HIV has all the support and all the tools she needs to get to an undetectable viral load. That's how we effectively end the HIV epidemic, in my opinion. Ladies, this has been awesome. And if our audience agrees with me, I want you to take to your chat feature right now and let Tori and Tammy and Beautiful know um, how much you appreciate their wisdom, their heart. Um, they brought it uh, in stilettos. Uh, and I, I am, thank you, Michelle. Michelle says standing ovation, uh, because you truly, uh, truly, truly, uh, deserve it. Tori say wedges, uh, cause just cause we fit it, that don't mean we can't still put on the stilettos. Uh, <laughs> Just awesome. Uh, I am going to ask that uh, as we uh, prepare for um, our closing, that we bring up um, two slides, one that talks about local resources uh, in Georgia. And Simone was a reminder to us why it is so important that we continue. Uh, thank you. Can we leave it right there? Because we do know it's a few. 
It's a few other resources that are missing. Um, Ellis has been putting resources in the chat throughout this whole uh, conversation. But if there's one that you hadn't seen in the chat or one that you don't see on this slide, I'm going to ask you to also drop that in right now because we don't want anybody to leave and need something. Beautiful just said a holistic approach. Tori just told us Black women living with HIV that they get what they need, period, with a T. Um, that if, if, if it's not up here, let's make sure that we are aware and we can share with each other uh, what those services um, are. Also, our um, uh, we'll leave it there for, for, for just a second. I want to add mine, ladies, if you don't mind, for 30 seconds. For me, I feel like the, the one thing we got to do that's going to get us closer uh, to ending this epidemic is we got to address racism in public health. It's there. It's alive and well. When you look at cities like Atlanta and you see some folks that are thriving in the same clinics that other that black women are going to and black women aren't achieving viral suppression and these other folks are doing well, we got to look at the structures. We got to address racism. We got to address why some clinicians are talking to some folks about PrEP, but they're not talking to other folks who look like us about PrEP. You know, all of those things must must be addressed. Okay, can we move on to our last slide? And these are your community announcements that we are about to make. November 3rd through the 4th is the Southern Solidarity HIV Advocacy uh, Summit. Um, I do believe this summit is housed, yep, here in uh, Atlanta. November 29th, the Xavier University of Louisiana is hosting its Shattering Barriers, Unveiling Truths and Overcoming Stigma in the HIV Narrative. We just set it off uh, for them, uh, laying the foundation around stigma um, as it relates to Black women. Yes, Michelle, these are our church announcements, so govern yourself accordingly. Uh, last but not least, uh, I want to thank uh, um, Elias and the team at Morehouse and Satcher uh, Institute for giving us this space to have uh, this conversation. I do hope that you walked away with at least one thing you felt like you could do or you could implement. If you say, no, I didn't, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and then you email me. Let's see if I can help you find something that was said, cause I took away a lot of nuggets. And finally, I'm not sure if this is the, um, the link for the evaluation. If not, Elias will add that if it hasn't been added already. Please, please complete the evaluation. I know you get it every time, but it's so important because if you want to have more conversations like this one, then your evaluation has to reflect that. So I'm going to turn it back over to our organizers. And again, uh, Cooper, uh, uh, Kenny, Beautiful. I'm going to make that your, oh, divine, divine. See, that's the elders. That's the sisterhood. Divine Cooper and Kenny, thank y'all so much, so much. I'm so glad to spend this time with you.